Hey folks, it's Jeremy Whaley here. Hope you're doing fantastic today. I want to talk about valuation. That sounds really boring, but I get asked this question a lot. And specifically what I get asked is I get asked what people think I think that the price of something should be. Usually, lately, that's gold, it's silver, it's Bitcoin, it's XRP or Ethereum, and sometimes it's a, a variety of different stocks. But gold and silver seem to be the hot ones right now, as well as various crypto. And it's a really hard question to answer. And so I'm actually gonna do this video to teach you why I give the answers that I give sometimes, why I tick people off when I give those answers, and how you can start thinking about valuations and whether or not you actually want to get into one of the investments that you're looking at doing. All right, so let's do it. So here we are, it's Jeremy Whaley from Trade Maestro. You can check us out over at trademaestro.com. The question is, how do we value an asset? That's a hard question to answer. And so I've titled this video, What's the Value? What's the Value? Or maybe I should have just titled it, What's it Worth? <laughs> and again, how do you know what something is worth? Whether you're looking at, uh, for example, a house that you're thinking about buying, or if you're looking at gold or silver, or any of these companies that I've put up on the screen. We've got Zoom, we've got Tesla, Peloton, Roblox, Toyota. I'm actually going to look at all of those in this video. And then I've also put Bitcoin and XRP. And what I'm gonna do throughout this video, I'm gonna kind of progressively teach this this um, this lesson. Uh, it's gonna be probably a pretty long video, about an hour. Um, you can probably jump off at any time, you know, not just because you get bored, but you may just, you know, you may have the answer. But if you want to go all the way to the end, I'm going to address all of these different assets and kind of give you my opinion on them and how I think about them and how you should think about them, at least the way that I see that you should think about them, okay? So let's get started and I'm going to jump right in. If you just want the quick answer, how do you know what something's worth? I'm going to give you the answer right now. And here is the answer. Are you ready? What is the value of an asset. What is the value of an asset? You're looking at gold, you're looking at silver, you're looking at XRP. Is it gonna be worth X, RP? Uh, you know, is it, is it gonna be worth, you know, some people are out there saying XRP is gonna be worth $1,000. Some people are saying it's gonna be worth more than Bitcoin, which is currently $50,000. So, you know, some people are saying Bitcoin is gonna be a million dollars. Some people are saying that that silver and gold are gonna be $10,000 an ounce or $50,000 an ounce. What is the value of an asset? How do we know? How do we know? Should I just go buy everything because somebody on YouTube said I should go buy it? Here's the answer. The answer to this question is always the same. You ready? It's whatever someone is willing to pay for it. This is the answer to the question every time what is the value of an asset? Now that might seem like a trite answer. It might seem like I'm being a smart ass and just not wanting to give you a direct answer. But the truth is the answer every time for every asset is whatever somebody's willing to pay for it. You might have the most incredible automobile in the world. Maybe it's the greatest Porsche that was ever made. And so you bring it out and you say, you know what? I'm going to sell this vehicle and I want $250,000 for it. If there's nobody that's willing to pay $250,000, it's only worth that money in your mind. It's not actually worth that in the real marketplace, right? At the end of the day, any asset that we have that we're trying to sell or that we're trying to buy is worth what somebody is willing to pay for it. So let's go back and let's think about some paintings, for example. There might be an amazing painting by a Van Gogh or a Monet, and it might be selling for millions of dollars. And you look at it and you're like, man, that's a gorgeous painting. Then you look at the price tag and you say, $50 million? It ain't that gorgeous. Well, not for you. You're not willing to pay it. Now, the question then becomes, is there a market for it? Is there somebody that's willing to pay $50 million for this painting or 20 million or whatever the, the price tag is? And if the answer is no, then maybe in theory, somebody could say it's worth $50 million, but in actual practicality, 
it's not worth it. It's only worth some, what someone's willing to pay for. And again, while this might seem like a trite answer, it might seem like I'm trying to get off, it's, it's not. What I'm trying to help you understand is why it is that you're buying assets. Maybe you're buying a house and you think that it should be selling for more, and it's not. Maybe you bought gold or silver and you've been sitting on it for a long time and you say, why has it not gone up? I've been watching all these videos and people tell me that the price should be X, whatever that price is, and it hasn't gone there. Why not? because people aren't willing to pay it. It's that that's simple. The answer is to the to the question every time what's the value of an asset? The answer is always whatever someone's willing to pay for. Okay? So, I've given you the answer right there. We're what 5 minutes into this video and now you have the answer, okay? Now I'm going to explain this answer throughout the rest of the video, and I'm going to talk to you about the way that I invest and the way that I look at assets, the way that I look at stocks that we trade, um, or when we think about gold or silver or cryptocurrency, how I think about them, so that then you can decide if you want to adopt that into your own philosophy. Now, I'm going to say this up front, okay? Let me, let me look at my video here, see if I can get a time. I'm not quite sure how far we are into this. I think we're about five minutes in. So just look at the timestamp right now. Look at the timestamp on the video, whatever that timestamp is. I'm saying this at that timestamp, okay? Whatever that time is. I don't need to come here and prove a point. I'm going to tick a bunch of people off, okay? I know it. I always tick people off. As soon as I do a video like this, if I talk about XRP, if I talk about Bitcoin, if I talk about gold, if I talk about silver, somebody's going to be mad at me. And I want to let you know you are free to have whatever opinion you want. And I'm free to have whatever opinion I want. I am teaching principles. I am teaching the way that I invest, the way that I look at the market. Now, you might think the way I look at the market is crazy. I'm going to justify it over the next 45 minutes or so throughout the rest of this video, okay? But what I want you to understand is a lesson that one of my mentors taught me several years ago, many, many years ago. And he said this, he said, Jeremy, you could be right, but if you want to be rich, you might have to let go of your dogma. And I, what does that mean? I have to let go of your dogma. Well, that particular mentor and I were in a conversation about what I saw, thought something should be worth. And he simply says, you, could, you, you have to decide. Do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? And what he was really getting at is I was being very stubborn about what I thought something was worth or the, the process for doing it, actually, is what this, this particular issue was about. And... Um, he was making the point that, look, you can be right, but you're just being stubborn. And if you want to make the money, you're going to have to let go of your ego. You're going to have to let go of your pride. You're going to have to let go of your dogma. Okay. This is an issue that is pervasive across the internet. It's across pretty much everywhere. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, you know, we, we would often, I would often hear, I don't know if everybody would, but I would often hear preachers that would get to the end of a of a message in their sermon and they would, you know, be given their altar call trying to get people to come forward and give their life. And they would say, just think about it. What if you get to your deathbed and what if you die and you find out that you were wrong? <laughs> and of course their intention there is to say, well, what if you found out you were wrong and there really was a God and you didn't accept God? That's their intention, right? Well, one day I remember this really distinctly. I was about 14 or 15 years old and I was like, well, what if you were wrong? What if your version of God wasn't right? And that was one of those pivotal moments in my life where I started asking questions. And I started saying, you know, just because somebody said something was true, I need to go prove it myself. I need to go build my own faith, if you will, defend it myself, find the empirical evidence, find the justification for it. So I'm going to say the same thing to you. As you think about the assets that you're investing in, as you think about what you want the value to be, as I upset you, for some of you, over the next 45 minutes, as I upset you in this, this explanation, um, ask yourself, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? And if the answer is you want to be right, then I'm probably not the right place for you because I'm just going to upset you. But if you want to understand how asset values work and you want to understand why it is that you're buying gold, you're buying silver, you're buying a stock and it doesn't do what you want it to do, if you want to understand why that happens, the next 45 minutes could truly change your paradigm for the rest of your life. And it'll change the way that you invest in everything, okay? So I really just want to get that out at the front here because I know I always upset people when I do these videos. And then, of course, when we get to the end of this video, now you're going to have some more information. You can make a decision, an educated decision, where you can say, do I want to continue the path that I'm on? Or maybe I want to make some adjustments to my investing philosophy 
and you know move forward in a different way. Okay. So with that said, I want to start with the first fallacy. The first fallacy, the fallacy that is taught, and really the fallacy that leads people to a very, very bad ideology, if you will, about their investment uh, process. And that fallacy says that core value matters. So yes, I'm actually saying core value does not matter. The fallacy is core value matters. Now, over the years, this has been termed value-based investing. From Investopedia, it's defined this way. It's an investment strategy that involves buying stocks or any other asset that appear underpriced relative to their intrinsic value. If you don't know what intrinsic value is, it just means that the core value of what that asset's worth if you look at that um, that asset and it's trading or it's selling for less than that core value, then you should buy it because it's going to come back up to some sort of a fair market value where it really should be trading. That's the theory of value-based investing. Now, this style of investing became very popular because of this man. His name is Benjamin Graham. He wrote this book, The Intelligent Investor. It came out. Uh, I want to say in the mid 40s, but I may have the date wrong. Uh, this is a book that has been heralded by the likes of Warren Buffett and some of the greatest investors in the history of the world. So, of course, it's the Bible of investing and everybody should be buying it and reading it, absorbing it and trading and investing just like the book The Intelligent Investor suggests, right? Eh, maybe. You know, another one of my mentors taught me, uh, he's, he said, you know, somebody comes out and says everyone should do this. And the answer is no, not everyone should do it. It's right for some people, but it's not right for everybody. The Intelligent Investor has some incredible information, and I certainly encourage anybody to read it. It also has a ideology or a philosophy of how to invest that I think as you go through the rest of this video, you're going to realize may not be that practical for the everyday investor like yourself. And when you understand what I'm going to teach you over the next however many minutes here, um, you're going to understand why some of, so many of your investment decisions have not played out the way you want them to play out. And so this book, while it does offer some incredible insight into value-based investing, while it has served a lot of investors over the years, it may not be the right solution for you. Okay. So that's kind of the premise that I want to set. And the core theory that is laid out with this idea of value vesting says this, if you find an asset that's selling for less than its intrinsic value, then eventually that asset's going to come back up to a fair price. Now, it makes sense. I mean, it just makes sense, right? I mean, if you're out on the street and you have a brand new Porsche and that's, let's say that price value should be $100,000, but it's selling for $20,000 on the street, well, you're like, man, this, this is a $100,000 car. Of course I'm going to buy it. So you buy it for $20,000. You say, I'm going to hold this for a little while. It's going to come back up and eventually I can sell it for $80,000 at least, if not $100,000. That, that just makes sense to anybody. The philosophy makes sense. And because the philosophy makes a logical sense, it's easy to adopt. But just like everything else in economics, there's always other principles that are at work that don't get factored in. And this is what I want to bring your awareness to. And this is going to help you understand why some of your assets aren't doing what you want them to do. Okay. So the, the million dollar question in this, the million dollar question out of all of it, core theory, if you find an asset that's selling for less than its intrinsic value, then eventually the asset's going to come back up to a fair price. Great core theory. Here's the question, the million dollar question. What's it worth? How do we know what something should be worth? How do we know what that car should be worth? How do we know what that stock should be worth? Or how do we know what the value of gold or silver or real estate or XRP or Bitcoin or Ethereum or anything else that we're looking at? How do we know what it should be worth? Well, the traditional wisdom would say, trust the fundamentals, trust the fundamentals. And so we call this fundamental investing. And I want to introduce you to the idea of fundamental analysis. Now, you've probably heard this over the years. You've heard it on television. You may have heard it on YouTube or on the Internet. You'll hear this from investors who have a very, very long term view. And they say, I'm going to buy this asset. I'm going to trust the fundamentals and eventually it will get there. Now, before I get into teaching about fundamentals, I want to tell you up front, um, it's not my problem with this. I'm going to explain that over the next few minutes, but I want to just put this idea out there for you. What if you buy an asset trusting the fundamentals and you hold that asset for 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years, you die and it never gets there. 
there's so many people over the years. I mean, I can just give you a list of people I know who died waiting for their investment to play out because they were trusting the fundamentals. It's a very, very long view. And the problem with it is you may not even live long enough to see that view come to fruition. So when you answer the question, which is really the core question of every investment, why am I placing this investment? I would assume the answer is because you want to make a profit on it. Well, if your view is so far out, I'm going to hold this thing for the long time. You may not live long enough to see this thing turn into a profit. Is that really where you should invest your money? And that's one of the questions that you need to be asking as you think about some of the assets you're investing in. Is it going to get where I want it to go fast enough to make it worth it for me? Because I can tell you that an asset's going to double in, in over, over a period of time. I can just pick an asset, any asset, gold, it's going to double. Okay, great. So if I invest in gold today at $2,000 an ounce, eventually it's going to be $4,000. Eventually it's going to be $5,000. It's going to be $10,000. It'll be $20,000. Okay, I just said it. Now, what I didn't tell you is what's the time frame. What I didn't say is if, if I invest, let's say $100,000 into gold today, and I tell you that eventually it's going to be worth $200,000, I didn't tell you if that's going to be eventually in six months or eventually in six years or eventually in 60 years. It does make a difference, doesn't it? Because eventually in six months, okay, that's probably a pretty good investment. If I can invest $100,000 and double it in six months, it's a great investment. If I can invest $100,000 and double it in six years, it's an okay investment. If I can invest $100,000 and double it in 60 years, that's a pretty terrible investment. And there's so many other things that you could have done with that money to far outperform the doubling over 60 years. So you get the idea. Time matters. When you're looking at investing, time matters. So coming back to the issue of fundamental, uh, fundamental analysis and fundamental investments, fundamental investing, the philosophy says we're going to trust the fundamentals. What are the fundamentals? Well, we look at fundamental analysis to answer this question. Fundamental analysis is going to focus on the statistics and the estimated value of a stock or any asset. And based on those numbers, it's going to come up with a value. Okay, so we're going to focus on the statistics and the estimated value. And based on those statistics and those numbers, we're going to know what it should be worth. So what are those statistics? Would you like to know? I'm just going to throw some out at you. Fundamental statistics look like things like company data, sector data, and economic data. So you've heard this all over the news. You know, we've got CPI coming out on Friday morning. Blah, 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 blah. The Federal Reserve is going to make an announcement on Wednesday afternoon. It's going to change the economic outlook. You've heard all these talking heads say it for years, right? What is this information? What are all these pieces of data? I'm going to roll through them really fast. You ready? Here we go. Company data looks like all the earnings data. Every quarter a company releases earnings data, that's company data. Financial statements, dividend history, policies of the company, sales data, management, the competition for the company. These are all pieces of fundamental data that can influence what the company could be worth, right? Now we look at sector data. This can be things like the influences of the sector, the general trends, the general economic issues relative to the sector. I know I went a little fast there. Then we look at economic data. We're looking at things like central bank and federal reserve policy. We're looking at the overall economy. We're looking at world markets. We're looking at political influences. We're looking at external threats to the business. These are, this is all kind of the big picture economic data. So it makes sense when you look at all these things, it, I go through them really fast, but every one of them, you're like, yeah, that's important. Yeah, that's important. Who's running the company? That's important. What's their sales data? That's important. What's their earnings data? That's important. What's the overall economy doing? That's important. And because, you know, investors are so prone to saying, I got to get it right. I got to get it right. You know, we look at these pieces of information and we say, that's obviously important. So I must dig into it. I must understand it. Here's the question question nobody asked is, do these things matter? <laughs> well, of course they matter. Yeah, of course all these things matter. But the better question is, do these things determine what someone's willing to pay? That's a different question. That's a much different question, isn't it? Do all these things matter? Yeah, they matter. Do they determine what someone's willing to pay? And the answer is no, they don't. All it is, is a theory. 
All these statistical pieces are is a bunch of data. It's a bunch of numbers that we run through various calculations and different people have different versions of it. Different people have different ways of analyzing it and coming up with their formulas. And they come up with their estimate, their theory of what they think the stock should be worth. What they think the housing market should do. What they think gold should be worth, what they think silver should be worth, what they think XRP should be worth, what they think Bitcoin should be worth. It's a theory. And then what happens is they go out and they publish it either through financial publications or through the internet, through YouTube, through wherever they're out there publishing stuff. They get a following. And then before you know it, there's actually a literal tribe of people following them saying, oh, such and such said that gold's going to be worth $50,000 an ounce. I believe them. Well, do you believe them because their data is solid? Do you believe them because you want to believe them? You have some gold, so it would work well for you. Or do you believe them because their theory has been proven? Like, like why do you believe their data? Why do you believe their forecast? And then the most important question, did it play out? Did it play out? I have been in this world for a long, long time. I mean, I've been and by this world. I mean, the investing world. I placed my first trade in 1999. And so that's been 20, literally 25 years now. Okay. Um, in all that time, I have heard people telling me incredible values for what silver should be, what gold should be, for what fill in the blank should be. And every time what I've proven is it was a theory. Sometimes it gets there. Sometimes it doesn't. And what I want to show you right now is I want to show you two companies that you're going to be very intimately acquainted with, two that you're going to know very, very well. And I'm going to show you how one of these companies should be worth twice as much as it is. And another one, the other one, should be worth probably a third what it is. But the facts are backwards. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to show you two hot companies. And this is going to relate. If you're if you're here because you want to learn about silver and gold, um, We'll get there at the end. If you're here because you want to learn more about crypto, we'll, we'll get there at the end. Right now, I want to use these these stories with, um, or these analysis with stocks because you can really understand them. It's really easy to relate to, okay? So the two companies I want to compare side by side are Tesla and Toyota. Tesla and Toyota. Tesla, one of the hottest automobile manufacturers right now. They've got these great electronic vehicles. They're just breaking all sorts of, you know, new innovation. They got a hot, hot CEO in the form of Elon Musk, who's just Mr. Innovation King. And man, they're tearing it up, right? So it's, it's one of the most valuable companies in the world right now. Then you got on the other side over here, Toyota. It's been around for a long, long time, cranking out automobiles and a little bit boring, but you know, they're going to run, Right. Well, let me show you the data here. And let's just ask the question. Let's ask the question, which one of these companies would I want to buy? Now, before I do this, I want you to understand if we were on a private business transaction, if, for example, I had a, 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 a deli and I wanted to sell this deli and it's a privately owned deli and I wanted to sell it and you were thinking about buying it, all these, this data, the, the financial data I'm about to share with you, it's pretty much the information you have to make the decision. Do you want to buy the deli? As a private business making a transaction between each other, this is the most important data you're going to look at. But what you're going to find is as we look at it in publicly traded companies, so Tesla, Toyota, because they're traded publicly, the data actually doesn't do what you think it should do. And I'm going to show that to you right now, okay? So let's take a look over here. On the left, we have Tesla. And I pulled these data, I, I pulled this num these numbers, but I'm going to show you where I pulled them from momentarily. Uh, this is the Tesla financial data. The market capitalization, if you can see it right here in this little box, it says market cap. The market capitalization is $636 billion right now. Now, if you don't know what market cap is, market cap is the number of outstanding shares multiplied times the stock price. In other words, if you were to go buy up every share of Tesla, if you were to, if you were to try to do that, it would cost you approximately this value. It's, it's the stock price times the number of outstanding shares. That's your market capitalization, okay? In the case of Tesla, that number is 636 billion, which means hypothetically, this isn't really theory, it's, it's hypothetical because it's not gonna happen like this, but 
hypothetically, if you are sitting on an extra 636 billion, and I'm sure you are, uh, if you're sitting on an extra 636 billion and you wanted to buy Tesla, you could just go into the market and buy up all the shares and you could own Tesla for a cool $636 billion. Okay, that, that's what market cap means. Market cap is the present market value of the stock. Okay, so in the case of Tesla, that number is $636 billion. Now, let's take a look at some of these numbers here. Uh, in this box over here on the left, you see Tesla financial data. The revenue is $96 billion a year. Okay, not too bad. I mean, that's not shabby. I could do something with that. Uh, the net income is $15 billion. Now, net income is the profit that they're making after they've paid their expenses. So this is the actual profit they're making. And if you run the numbers on that, that means they're making about a 15% profit. Okay. Now, look, I, I'm not complaining about that. Any business doing a, almost $100 billion and making 15%, I'm not upset with that. That's great, right? Question is not if the numbers look good. The question is, what's the stock worth? According to the market cap, the stock is worth $636 billion. Now, let's go compare that to Toyota. Okay, so come over here to the right, and you're going to see in this right square over here, the revenue for Toyota is $308 billion. Whoa! That is literally three times. It's slightly more than three times the revenue for Tesla. So Toyota is selling $300 billion worth of Camrys and Toyota Tundras and all the other cars that Toyota makes. They're selling $300 billion a year worth of those vehicles compared to a measly $96 billion with Tesla. Oh, well, they probably don't have the same kind of margins. You, you know what? You're right. You're right. So let's look at that. The net income for Toyota... Um, is 31 billion, okay, which works out to about a 10% profit margin. So you could say, well, Tesla has a 5% five, 5 better profit margin, so it's worth more. Well, wait a second. Let's look at the market capitalization. Market cap for Toyota is 307 billion, whereas the market cap for Tesla is 636 billion. In other words, it would cost you, if you were to go out and buy every share of Toyota, you could buy every share for $307 billion, or you could buy every share of Tesla for $636 billion. Tesla, on book value right here, literally has twice the value of Toyota. But when you look at the numbers, Toyota has three times the revenue. And while their profit margin is lower, the actual dollar for dollar amount coming in, Toyota's making $31 billion a year. Tesla's making $15 billion. Toyota's bringing $31 billion cash in the pocket. That's real money. By the way, Toyota actually distributes some of that as a dividend. Tesla doesn't. And uh, they've been doing it consistently. And Tesla hasn't. So let's go a little bit deeper here. But before I do that, just understand this. If, I'm, I'm going to put this back on the screen in case you want to look at it. Understand, let's just make it a house. This is the equivalent of saying on the right, you have a house, we'll call it the Toyota house, and you could buy that house for 300, we'll say uh, 300,000. You could buy this house on the right for 300,000 or the house on the left for 600,000. The house on the right, you could rent it and make 31,000 a year. The house on the left, you could rent it and make 15,000 a year. Which one are you gonna do? <laughs> $300,000 house making 30,000 a year? $600,000 house making $15,000 a year. Well, anybody who's a smart business person is going to choose Toyota. It's the better deal. It's making more money. It's got three times the revenue to work with. It's got twice the profit to work with. And as you're going to see right now, they've been doing this year over year for a long time. So I got to get over to my charts here and I'm going to show you where this data came from. I'm using a software called TradingView. It's available at tradingview.com. There's a free version, so you can just go pull this stuff up yourself, and then you can know that I'm not blowing smoke. Um, what I want to do is over here on the right side of TradingView, you will see I've got a watch list over here. I'm going to come down. i got Tesla pulled up, and I'm going to come down here to, you see these little blue bars? There's a button that says More Financials, and I'm going to click that, and that brings up this graph right here, okay? This is where I pulled that data from. Okay, so I just went through the annual and the quarterly data. And what you're going to see if you look at the quarterly data, the quarterly data for Tesla is pretty good. 
25, 24 billion, 23 billion, 24 billion, 25 billion. You know, it's consistently there. But when you look at the profit margin, it was only this last quarter where they really had a great profit margin. They had 31% this last quarter. Previous quarter was 7.9%, 10%, 10%, 15% uh, in Q4 2022. If I look at the annual, look at what's happened with, with Tesla over the last five or six years here since 2019. In 2019, they only had 24 billion in profit and they had an operating net income of minus 870 million. In other words, they went almost a billion dollars in the hole in 2019. That's not good. 2020, they finally turned a profit, had 31 billion in revenue. They made uh, about a 2% profit, $690 million. The next year, $53 billion in revenue. So they're growing, 10% profit. 2022, they had $81 billion in revenue. And in 2023, they had $96 billion. Okay, so there is definitely a line of progression here. You can definitely say Tesla's growing. You can say that their profit margin is increasing. You can say that their sales are increasing. The company is not bad. I mean, look, I love Tesla. I love Elon Musk. I love everything about it. I'm not asking the question of if it's a good company. I'm not asking the question of, do I think it's going somewhere? We're asking the question, is it a good value? We're asking the question, is it priced fairly? We're asking the question, what should the company be worth? And based on their financial data, what we see is we see that it's been growing, but dollar-wise, it hasn't necessarily been as extraordinary as Toyota. Okay, with this data that we see here, Tesla has become somehow worth six, over $600 billion. In fact, that price is actually down a little bit. Let me just show you. If you look at the stock price here, better share my screen. If you look at the stock price here, uh, the beginning of 2022, value-wise, um, Tesla was trading over $400 a share. This was before the, the stock split. It was actually, uh, I'm going on memory here. I think it was around $1,600. Uh, this was before the stock split again. But um Anyway, it has dropped as low as $100 a share. So that was a 75%, yes, 75% sell-off that we had in Tesla. And the current value is right around $200. So it, it right now with the with the valuation at 600, uh, 600 or so billion, I think it was 630 billion. Over here, it was about 1.2 trillion, just to put it in perspective. Okay, so it has revalued. At one point, it was worth $1.2 trillion. That was in 2022 when they weren't hardly even making a profit. Now, let's compare this. Let's compare this now. What I want to do is pull up um, Toyota. And this is ticker symbol TM. You see Toyota Motor Company, so we'll pull that up. And you can see that the stock price has done really well, but it's not that much better than it was just two years ago. I mean, it's 2022, it's slightly better. We had a huge dip in here. We went from uh, just over 210, about $220 a share down to uh, about 135 during the 2022 sell-off. And it has grown from there, yes. Okay, so stock prices come back up. Current market capitalization, as I already showed you, we're gonna come down here and go to our fundamentals. Um, current market capitalization is 300, just over 300 billion. Okay. So that's where the number is. Now look at this folks. This is crazy. I'm going to come down here. These are your numbers going back to 2018. And I know the numbers are really small, so I'm just going to read them to you. Revenue 272 billion with a 16 billion dollar profit next year 274 billion 18 billion profit next year 256 billion 21 billion in profit next year 279 billion with 25 billion in profit next year 274 billion with 18 billion in profit do you see what's happening folks this company the numbers are as consistent as their engines this company is fine tuned i mean it is just trudging it out pounding out 20%, 20, 20 billion, 15 billion, 18 billion, 20 billion, 30 billion in profits, 8% profit, 10% profit, 11% profit consistently every year, quarter after quarter, year after year. I haven't gone back more than five years on this, but I'm sure it's probably decade after decade. This company is as finely tuned as you could imagine. If I think about a business that I want to buy, that's it. 
If I just think about, you know, if I had a deli I was selling, or if I was looking at buying a deli, I want the one that is finely tuned. It is just operating. And I know it's going to be spinning out my 10% profit every year. By the way, I can pick it up for half the market cap, 300 billion versus 600 billion. It's got three times the revenue and twice the actual dollar amount in profit. Why is the market capitalization for Toyota half of Tesla? If I follow a value vesting philosophy, one of two things needs to happen. Either Toyota should come up in value or Tesla should come down in value. It's the only thing that should happen, right? Yeah, that's it. Like th This is not hard logic here. Toyota is spinning out three times the revenue, twice the actual dollar amount of profit, and it's selling for 50% of the market cap of Tesla. This, this is not a hard question. It's easy. Toyota should be selling for twice as much. It's just that simple. It's got to be, right? From a value vesting standpoint, if I'm looking at a asset that is selling for less than it's worth, with Tesla's worth $600 billion, Toyota should be worth at least $600 billion, maybe even $900 billion because it's got three times the revenue. But in the real world, it's not happening. I come back to that question I asked, do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? Because as much as I can sit here and tell you this is what it should be, I have been using this example for almost four years. I update the numbers. Toyota, is, Toyota ain't going to triple. It's not going to go up two or three times just because the book value thinks it should be. Just because Tesla's worth three times doesn't mean Toyota's going to go up that much. This is the fallacy. That's what I'm talking about. Whenever I say that there's a fallacy of, of, of investing that first fundamental fallacy is this idea that the core value matters. Does it matter? Yeah, it matters. Does it determine what someone's willing to pay? No. No, it doesn't. Therefore, it doesn't really matter. So how can we, how can we analyze it? How can we actually know what a trade should be worth? Well, I use a form of analysis called technical analysis. We actually study the price of the asset, we, we study the actual trades as they get placed. And it looks at two different things, the price that has been, been trading at and the volume that's there to support it, okay? Now here's how we're gonna define technical analysis as opposed to fundamental analysis. Technical analysis assumes that all the information that can be known is already known and that knowledge has already been factored in. In other words, yeah, we know the numbers for Tesla, we factored that in. Yeah, we know the numbers for Toyota. We factored that in. Okay. So why is Tesla selling? Why is the market cap for Tesla twice what it is for Toyota? Because we factored that in and we think it should be worth more. Well, how do I analyze what you think it should be worth? Well, this is what we're selling it for. This is what we're buying it for. Oh, so when we think about the value of an asset, when we think about what is a stock worth, it's worth what someone's willing to pay for it. The fundamental analysis looks at the theory of what we think it should be worth. Technical analysis looks at the fact of what it is actually worth now, in this moment, in this snapshot in time. What's it worth right now? What's someone willing to pay for it? Now, in theory, in theory, fundamentals should drive the market. But if fundamentals drove the market, then your stock price would look like this right here. It would look like a stair step. You would have data that comes out, the price would be valued, and then a new quarterly earnings report would come out, and then the price would revalue, and it would, would skip up, and then it would stabilize. And then if, you know, maybe there was a uh, uh, an economic piece somewhere. Maybe the Federal Reserve did an announcement and the price goes up some more and then it stabilizes and it stays at that price. Then maybe something happens and it comes down a little bit. In theory, if fundamentals drove the market, that's what your price of your asset would look like. And I know it and you know it. Everybody knows it. And deep down, we all kind of think that's what should happen. 
Because if you ever you if you've ever traded a stock, let's say that you owned Google and one day you pulled up your iPhone and you looked at the stock prices, you're like, oh no, Google's down twenty dollars today. Why is it down? So you start Googling, why is Google down twenty dollars today? And you find out that there's nothing there's no news. There's no reason for it to be down $20. And you're like, of course, they, they censored the data. It's Google. So you, you quickly go over to Yahoo Finance. Why is Google down $20? And you search and you search and you can't find the answer. And all through the day, you're just watching. It's $20. It's down $30. It's down $40 today. Why? You're pulling your hair out. You go home. Your spouse is noticing that you're noticeably sad. And he or she says to you, why are you so down? You say, my Google stock is down $40 today. And I don't know why. Well, did you Google it? Yeah, I Googled it. Of course, they censored the data. They don't, they don't want to tell me why their stock's down. <laughs> no, you, oh, I'm laughing because I know that everybody's done that. And I know that deep down, that's the emotion. Because intuitively, we all think that this is what should happen. Intuitively, we all think if the fundamentals changed, the value should change. And if the fundamentals didn't change, then the value should not change in theory. But that's not what happens. The reality of the market is this right here. The reality is the price goes way up and it goes way down and it's completely irrational. This is the reality of the market. The reality is that earnings results can come out and they can be fantastic and the stock goes down. Earnings results can come out and they can be terrible and the stock goes up. And people say, why? And the answer is because fundamentals don't matter. The core value of the asset doesn't actually matter to the price. The truth is this, the markets, unlike what Benjamin Graham said, the markets are not efficient. The, the entire efficient market hypothesis that is taught in higher education and around the world, and it has been for the last hundred years, it is wrong. The efficient market hypothesis is wrong. I said it. I'm going to get hate messages right now. You're all starting to type into the chat and into the comments. He's wrong. He's terrible. Don't listen to him. Look, it's wrong. Markets are not efficient. I just proved it to you, and I'm going to prove it to you some more. But I just proved it to you. Markets are not efficient. Fundamentals do not drive the price. Well, then what, what does? If fundamentals don't determine the, the value of the, of the asset, what determines the value? <laughs> You're not going to like the answer, but I'm going to tell it to you right now. You ready? Here's the answer. The answer is speculation. Speculation. Well, speculation. What is that? It's, it's, it's how people feel about it. <laughs> yeah, it's emotion. Emotion, how the people, the individuals that are trading that asset feel about it. People that are trading Tesla are very optimistic and they drive the price up and it's trading for two or three times Toyota. People who are trading Toyota, not as emotional about it. They're like, yeah, we feel like this is where it should be. And they trade it at that price and they're willing to buy it at that price. But if you tripled the market cap for Toyota, people wouldn't pay that price. They would say, no, it's too expensive. Why? Tesla's trading for this because it's Toyota. It's not Tesla. But it makes no sense. The fundamentals say that Toyota should be worth three times more. Yeah, but I'm not willing to pay that. I think it's too much. As long as the asset that you're trading, that you're investing in, as long as it is subject to the emotions of the general public, fundamental analysis and the theoretical book value does not matter. And you say, why does it not matter? And the answer is simple, because nobody cares. Nobody cares. The public does not care. They're not informed enough to care. They're not informed enough to know. And so what happens is Tesla can be too expensive and it's in a trend and they announce a stock split and the public says, who cares if it's too expensive? Let's go. And they jump on and they drive the price even higher, another two or three times higher than it was. Market can be completely great and a stock starts to sell off and the public says, oh no, I'm afraid I'm losing everything. And their irrational behavior drives the price of the stock down and there's nothing you can do about it. And then people, they step back, they, back and they say, well, it was just market manipulation. It's because the hedge funds were manipulating the market. Or maybe it was just the public. When you understand asset values from the position of public emotion, everything makes total sense. 
Now we can get out of this whole conspiracy that everything is manipulated. And I'm not saying that there's no manipulation. I'm just saying that not everything is manipulated. I've been doing this a long, long time. And I understand how the human emotion works in the market. This is actually real world behavioral finance. This is what's really happening in the market. What's really driving the market is the optimism that a trader has that the price is going to go higher or the fear that the trader has that the price is going to go lower. That's it. It's completely irrational, but it doesn't matter if it's irrational. It's the fact of what's actually happening and what's actually happening right now. And so when you look at any asset that you're trading or that you're investing in, that you're thinking about getting into, you can do, you can do hours, you can do weeks worth of analysis on what you think the value should be. You can watch hours and hours of videos and what you think the value of gold should be. You can look at hours of videos of what you think the price of Bitcoin should be or the price of Tesla should be. You can look at hours and hours of research and none of it really matters if the public does not agree. Because at the end of the day, the only thing that matters in terms of the price is what someone's willing to pay for it. No, it does not have to come up. People say, oh, the price of silver has to come up to this. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. Oh, the price of gold has to be this because this and that and because of inflation. No, it doesn't. As long as it's subjected to public opinion, it does not have to happen. Don't buy into the hyperbole that it does. Oh, Jeremy just said that gold's not a good investment. I didn't say that. I did not say that. We're 45 minutes into this presentation and somebody's going to put in the comments, oh, it's a very pessimistic view of gold. He doesn't think it's going anywhere. I didn't say that. Don't put words in my mouth. I'm teaching you how assets work. Do you want to be right or do you want to be rich? It's a fair question. Do you want to be right and prove that you did the research and, oh, it was, I was right. I'm going to hold to it. I'm, I'm committed. That's called dogma. <laughs> is your dogma more valuable to you or is it more valuable to you that you actually have the information you can work with and you can make an actual educated decision? Now, again, I want to be really clear. The price of gold could easily go to 5,000. It could easily go to 10,000. It could easily go to 20 or 50,000. It could go to 100,000. It could go to a million dollars an ounce. But only if the people who are buying and selling it are willing to pay that price. The market value of any publicly traded asset on any level is only going to go as high as the public is willing to pay. The end. Oh, well, well, what if it becomes too cheap? Then somebody's going to drive it back up. M not necessarily. Not necessarily. And I'm going to show you some examples right now. Okay? So if you want to get off, if you've seen all you can handle from this video, I get it. But I'm going to show you right now two of the worst companies I have ever seen. Two of them. And I'm going to ask the question, are these companies just run by complete idiots? Are these companies that, you know, have the worst CEOs in history? Let's go take a look at them. You say, what could these companies be? Two of them, Peloton and Roblox. Okay. Peloton and Roblox. We're going to come back over to our charts here and I'm going to pull these up. Peloton is the first one. And uh, if you're not familiar with Peloton, this is a company that makes these bicycles. They're stationary bikes that you ride like an exercise bike. Uh, well, they are an exercise bike, but they, they have a video on it. And um, you can actually engage with people around the world. And so it's, it's like an interactive stationary bike cycling experience. And during the COVID, they really gained a lot of market share. This is crazy. This is, this is crazy. I can't, every, every time I look at this, I shake my head. All right. So this is the uh, price of the stock over the last several years from, from the time that it IPO'd. It IPO'd just before COVID. What a perfect timing, right? So you can see over here on the far left, uh, this was the end of 2019 and it IPO'd around just over $20 a share. 
and uh, COVID happened March, April, May. And from the beginning of COVID to the peak, which was the beginning of 2021, Peloton increased in value to $170 a share. So we went from $20 a share to $170 a share, and then it promptly fell, and it has continued to fall, and it finally has stabilized around $10 a share until recently it is over here around five dollars a share okay so current price last traded price was four dollars and 54 cents a share Woo! now you might say well see that stock price is right it, it, you know you said it was a terrible company and look what they did yeah it's the right price well let's just look at it okay i'm just going to show you some interesting things on it and i'm going to ask the question how are they in business this uh, this isn't really relevant necessarily but since we talked about market cap Market cap on this is 1.6 billion, 1.67 billion. I just want to show you these results right here. In 2019, uh, revenue was 915 million, so just under a billion, and their operating expenses or their um, their net income was minus 245 million, which meant they were in the hole 26 percent. Okay, so in 2019, they went in the hole 26 percent on 915 million in revenue. The next year in 2020, they increased revenue to 1.8 billion. So they literally doubled the revenue and they also doubled their losses. Instead of losing the whatever, what was that number? Instead of losing 200, oh, actually they didn't quite double losses, excuse me. Um, their losses were only 70, 71 million, okay? Which represented only a negative uh, almost 4%. Okay, so that one wasn't too bad. The next year in 2021, get this folks, they had $4 billion in revenue. This is crazy, $4 billion in revenue. And their net income went down to minus 189. They ended up, to, they, they managed to double their revenue and double their losses. Still holding at this time about a 5% loss, 4.7. And then in 2023, look what happened. Their revenue, $3.5 billion their net income minus 2.8 billion. They had a 78% loss, almost 79% in one year. 2023, slightly better, <laughs> slightly better, 2.8 billion in revenue. And their loss was only 45%, which was 1.2 billion. So here's my question, who's writing the billion dollar checks? Because <laughs> we're going in the hole over a billion dollars a year. I don't get it. I don't know how. I mean, I just cannot imagine if I had somebody that was running a company for me, like me year over year, we're growing. Uh, between 2019 and 2020, doubled our revenue. 2020 to 2021, doubled it again. So in two years, they 4 x their revenue. And I mean, this is a tumor. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I'm making fun of it. I'm also bringing to your awareness that this is, these are the kind of numbers when you look at the fundamentals, you're like, that's terrible. Of course, this, this company is terrible. How can you not look at those numbers and think that this company is absolutely terrible? It's a miracle that this company's in business until we look at the next one. You ready for the next one? This is a company called Roblox. Um, and then I'm going to bring this home to a point in a moment. Now I do know that stock price has mirrored the fact that this is a terrible company right now. Um, and that, that explains why the stock price is done when it's done. What it doesn't explain is it does not explain why the price did this. So before I move on, let's just talk about that for a minute. During this time frame, during this time frame of COVID, um, we started off $20 a share was our stock price, whatever that market cap was. It was it's probably around 20 billion at the time. I'm, I'm going off of estimates off the top of my head. Um, but it, it, it started $20 a share. We ended at 170. So you just do the math on it. 40 would be 100%. 60 would be 200%. 80 would be 300%. 100 would be 400%. Keep going. 120, 500%. 140 would be 600%. Uh, 160 would be 700 percent, 700 to 800 percent growth in one year. 800 percent growth. Why? 
Fundamentals didn't justify it. You saw the sales data. The revenue doubled. We went from 900 million in one year to 1.8 billion the next year. Then it doubled again to 4 billion. But that actually happened over here. What? Yeah. Yeah, it did. When it was making 4 billion was at the end of 2021. So the stock price was crashing even though it was making double the revenue again. Do you see how irrational stock price is relative to what's actually happening under the hood? That's what I'm trying to articulate here. Is I'm trying to show you this is irrational behavior. And yet this is the reality of the market. So if somebody comes to me and they say, Jeremy, what should a price be trading for? I can't give you the answer. It should be X. Why can I not give you that answer? Because it's all dependent on what someone's willing to pay for it. If you want to answer the question of what could it be trading for, we have to look at it through a completely different lens. And that lens is the perspective of what are people willing to pay? What will they be willing to pay in the future? Oh, well, we'll just do the estimates. No, the estimates don't work. Let me show you another one here. This one's going to blow your mind. This is Roblox. Okay. RBLX is the ticker symbol. If you're not familiar with Roblox, this is a gaming platform. It's all online. It's all the craze. The kids love it. My kids love it. I hate it. I absolutely resent this thing. You can look at the stock price and you can say, whoa, that looks terrible. Well, maybe. It does look terrible, by the way. Uh, but the story is not how terrible this looks. The story is in the numbers. And let me show you real fast. I'm going to give you a quick overview orientation to the stock. Started off its IPO at $70 a share. We doubled to $140 a share. We tanked down to about $25 a share. And it has been stable for all this time since about mid-2022 at around mid-40s, you know, 40 Sometimes it's $40 a share, sometimes it's $50 a share, roughly in that trading range right there, okay? So that's what the uh, overview is for Roblox. If I come down here and I pull up these financials on this, you're gonna be like, wow, this is interesting. $27 billion market cap. Now here's the question, is it worth $27 billion? Okay. Now, all of you, even if you've not been investors up until now, you've been on this journey with me for the last hour or whatever it is that we've been uh, doing this video. You've learned a little bit, right? You've been through, this is basically a full-blown class. I'm just doing it as a, as a video for you. Um, you've learned a little bit, okay? So you've learned that market cap is what the company's worth. You've learned that revenue is what they're selling, and you've learned that net income and percentage of profit is what their actual profit margin is. You've learned those things, right? So now let's take a look over here at Roblox, and you tell me, is Roblox worth $27 billion? Dun, 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 Dr. Evil. Is it really worth $27 billion? I don't know. Let's look at the numbers. Going back as far as it's been publicly traded, it has never made a profit. Ever. Not only has it never made a profit, it has continued to grow revenue and grow its losses every year like clockwork. As good as Toyota is, Roblox is the opposite. Toyota is a finely tuned business machine. Toyota is operating on all cylinders. It's doing everything the way it should be. Roblox is a disaster. I'm realizing I never shared the screen, so let's do this again. This will, uh... you know, my whole Dr. Evil thing didn't make as much sense since you couldn't see the numbers. <laughs> I think I was, I think I was drawing up here, $27 billion. Is it worth it? Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> All right, here we go. $27 billion is the market cap. Now let's come down here. This is what I was just talking through. You can see in 2019, when it went public, $500 million in revenue, loss of $70 million. So they spent $70 million more than they made. Gentlemen, can you imagine making $500 million, bringing it into your home and spending $70 million more? What would your spouses say? It would be a sad day, right? I mean, $500 million and you can't figure out how to turn a profit, at least break even. All right, well, let's look at 2020. 2020, the numbers are $923 million, so we doubled in revenue. Fantastic. 
and our net income is negative 253 million. Okay, that is impossible, right? No, it's not. In fact, 2021, we doubled, more than doubled our revenue yet again, 1.9 billion in revenue, and we've lost 491 million in our net income. This is going the wrong way, folks. 2022, I'm telling you, it's the worst, worst run company I've ever seen. 2.2 billion in revenue, negative 924 in income. 2023, 2.8 billion negative, 1.1 billion. Well, at least we slowed the rate at which we're going in the hole. Now, here's the thing that really confuses me about this company. I don't know where they're spending money. I mean, I literally, I cannot fathom where they are spending the money. And I'm not trying to be a sarcastic. The natural response would be, oh, well, they're building infrastructure and they're paying for game developers. Actually, you know who develops these games? The users. The kids, my kids. Quite possibly your kids or your grandkids. The kids are the ones that are developing these games. They're building this 2.8 billion, I put an M there, but it's a B. They're building that $2.8 billion in revenue off of the kids that are buying the games from other people on the platform. And they're paying, Roblox takes a percentage of everything, but the major developers are the kids. So I have, I have a lot of questions about this company. Let's go down that conspiracy rabbit hole for a minute. Hmm. Tell me. Who wrote the check for the 70 million in loss? Who wrote the check for the 253 million? Who wrote the check for the 491 million in loss? Who wrote the check for the 900 million? Who wrote the check for the 1.1 billion? Oh, they took it out of the out of their 2.8 billion in profit. No, 2.8 billion in revenue is not 2.8 billion in profit. 2.8 billion in revenue with a loss of 1.1 means they spent 3.9 billion. You made 2.8, you spend 3.9. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I have a lot of questions about this company, but here's what I can tell you. If this CEO worked for me, he would be fired. Just absolutely. I mean, this is a terrible, terrible business. So now I come back to the question. With those kind of numbers, why is this company trading, forget the, the share value, why does it have a market cap of $27 billion? Huh? What should it be worth? I said earlier in this video, you can be right or you can be rich. I'm, I'm showing extreme examples here because I want you to understand how irrational the market really is. The market's irrational. You may not like it, but it is. Okay. Now what I want to do is I want to show you a sleeper company. And then we're going to land this whole thing here in a moment. We'll talk about gold and silver and crypto a little bit. Okay. So let me show you the sleeper. And the sleeper is a platform that probably all of you are familiar with. It's called Zoom. Okay. Zoom is, um, well, it's taken over, right? I mean, everybody's familiar with Zoom meetings now. Well, let me show you the numbers from Zoom. Okay. So we're going to come back over here and I'm going to type in the ticker symbol ZM for Zoom. And uh, here's your stock price for Zoom and your chart. Let's resize that a little bit. Now you're looking at this and you're probably thinking like most people, whoa, that looks terrible. This company is in big trouble. I mean, this company's going down. Oh yeah, we want to run from that one. Well, and if you thought that, then I think you would be wrong. I really do. From a, from a business standpoint, this is a sleeper. And I'm going to show you why, okay? So let me give you a quick orientation here. Um, on the right, or the, excuse me, the left over here, when the company IPO'd, they IPO'd uh, just towards the middle of 2019, and it was around $70 a share, okay? 
um, did its thing in 2019. 2020 happened. COVID happened. Company ran up to almost 600 billion. Uh, 600 million. Forgive me. Six hundred dollars a share. It was about five hundred seventy-five dollars a share, not million, just five hundred seventy-five. And then it proceeded to tank. And the current numbers are we're about seventy dollars a share. Okay, so this is interesting. When you look at that picture, you you have to say, okay, well, the stock clearly it was a bubble for COVID, and it just returned to where it had started. Now most people would look at that, and that that would be their interpretation, and you'd be completely wrong. Let me show you what the actual numbers are, and I'm going to ask you what should the stock be worth. Such an important question, right? What should it be worth? On the left over here, you see the market cap is almost 19 billion, 18.9 billion. That, that fluctuates, by the way, with stock price. So that's the market cap is 19 billion, and I want to show you these numbers going all the way back to 20, uh, actually 2018. In 2018, it had 330 million in revenue and zero net income. Uh, 29, so no profit, but they weren't losing money, just no profit. Uh, 2019, 622 million in revenue and 21 million in profit, which was a 3.4%. Okay, so that's pretty good. 2020, you ready for this? 2.6 billion in revenue. 2.6 billion in revenue, and they grew profit from 21 million to 671 million dollars in profit. Whoa. Let that sink in, folks. When you look at the growth of a company, sales, we went from 622 million in one year. The next year, which was the COVID year, we went to 2.6 billion. Three times? No, more than that. Four times? Five times? You don't have to be good at math to, to do what we do here. <laughs> so if we if we doubled revenue, it'd be 1.2 billion. If you tripled revenue, it'd be 1.8. Four times would be 2.4. So a little bit better than four times revenue. Four X in one year. That's why the stock price shot up, right? Watch this. This is stunning what I'm going to share with you. The next year, the next year, 2021, $4.1 billion in revenue with a 33% profit margin coming in at $1.3 billion in profit. Holy cow. This company is firing in all cylinders. 2022, 2022, 4.3 billion. And you notice that the profit went way down. Why? And I'm going to show you in a minute, okay? But just let that sink in. Every year, year over year, Zoom has grown their, their revenue base and they've grown their profit every year by huge numbers it's not like peloton where you know they peaked and then you know their subscribers went down the subscribers continue to go up with zoom they continue to grow this company's being run very very well so you, you ask the question well why why did all the profit margin disappear in 2022 i'm going to show you in a minute but before i do that um because of the way their fiscal year falls they don't have the annual up here for 2023 so i'm gonna have to go to quarterly so we're going to have to just wipe those numbers, sorry. Quarterly for 2023. So now we're not looking at um, annual, we're looking at quarterly. 1.1 billion, 1.1 billion, 1.1 billion. So th th three quarters in a row, 1.1 billion, we're on track for 4.4 billion. You see, we maintain revenue. Now look at the profit margin for those quarters. 15 million, 1%. The next was 181 million, we we. Knocked our profit margin up to 16%. Next quarter, 141 million in profit margin, 12% profit. We went, we, we've reversed the profit margin problem. So then you say, well, where did the money go? What happened at the end of 2022? I'm going to show you. You ready for this? You go down. Oh, 
Where'd he go? For some reason, my thing's not going down far enough. Let's do it up here. I may not be able to do this fast enough to make it interesting. I've probably already put some of you to sleep. 2022, right here. Financing activities. That's where the money went. It's a combination of paying off debt and maybe making some additional investments. It's the opposite of Peloton. It's the opposite of Roblox. This is a company that is incredible right now. Why? Why is... So understand. I'm going to come back here and let, help you understand. From 2019, when we were doing... Um, I forgot the revenue number, but it was less than a billion. 2020, when we had... It was like 600 million, right? 600 million in revenue up to 2.6 billion in revenue and revenue continued to grow 4 billion. It has maintained 4 billion, 4 billion, but the price and the market cap has returned to the same market cap that it was before COVID. We've grown revenue four times. We've paid off debt. We're running 20, 30% margins and we're the same market cap that we were before COVID? You think fundamentals matter? I think I have just laid out in the last hour for you and anybody who cares to be honest. The fundamentals don't matter because nobody cares. Why is, why is Zoom trading for $70 a share and why is the market cap only 19 billion? I don't know. It makes absolutely no sense to me. Zoom, of all the companies that, that had this big bubble in COVID, Zoom is the one that has the best numbers. So now naturally, if you're a value investor, you should be listening to me and you'd be like, oh, well, I'm going to buy Zoom. It's eventually going to go higher. Well, you might be sitting on that for 20 years because I don't know when it's going higher. Some of you listening to me right now, you might be saying, thinking, oh, well, I should go buy Zoom. Did, did you just say you should buy Zoom? No, I didn't say that. I said that the fundamental numbers... The core numbers suggest that Zoom is undervalued. Or do they? What, what should the value be? I don't know. I do know that if it was worth $19 billion before COVID and revenue is up from $600 million to $4 billion a year and they're running the kind of profit margins that they're running, it's got to be worth more than it was before COVID. It's got to be. It just makes sense. And yet, it's not. How do we justify this? It's a sleeper if you ask me. So now we ask the question about these other assets. And these are the ones that I get asked about every week, sometimes every day. What's the price of gold? What should the price of gold be? What should the price of silver be? What should XRP be? What should Bitcoin be? Is million dollar Bitcoin for real? You really think Bitcoin's going to be a million dollars? Yeah, if the public wants to take it there. If the public wants to take it there, let's come to Bitcoin for a moment. We're going to pull up a Bitcoin chart. This is the chart for Bitcoin, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask you a question. What changed? What changed between 2020 when Bitcoin was, you know, eight to $10,000 a token and spring of 2021 when Bitcoin was $64,000 a token. Eh, not a lot changed necessarily. I mean, you know, we went through a pandemic and there was a whole lot of fear and we had inflation and people surged into Bitcoin. It was a bubble. See, everybody comes, comes up with their own answers, right? What changed? What really fundamentally changed? There was a lot more demand for it. That's the big thing that changed, okay? Then here's the question I have for you. What changed between April of 2021 and July when Bitcoin sold from 64,000, 50% went down 50%. That says 50%, even if you can't read it. What caused it to go down 
and uh, sell for less than 30000 And then what caused it to double back to over 60000 And then what caused it to sell off more than that all the way back down to 16000 And then what caused it to go all the way back up to 52000 where it is right now? What caused it? What changed? I'll tell you what changed. What people were willing to pay for it. That's what changed. It's a factor of supply and demand to the extent that you have people that are selling it. And when we get very high, people naturally want to cash out. They want to make some profit. And so as Bitcoin got to some peaks, people started selling. And then other people said, well, it's 60000 It's just too much. I'm not going to pay it. Then it drops down to 30000 And they say, you know what? I think I'll buy it. It was 60000 just a couple months ago. It looks like a good price. Now, they drive the price back up to 60000 We get back over 60000 They say, you know what? It's expensive. Last time I was here, it tanked. I think I'll sell. I doubled my money. I think I'll sell. So they take their profit and a bunch of people flooded in right at the worst time. They flooded in right at the top and they wrote it all the way down. And some of you might've done that. Some of you were buying Bitcoin up here at 60,000 while it was tanking. And then you get down here and you finally give up and you pull the plug or maybe you buy into the whole hodl. We're going to hold on for dear life. And eventually the price starts to rally again and we have a more sustainable trend. What made it worth 52,000 in 2024, when it was only worth 18000 in 2023. Oh, it wasn't really worth that. We always knew it was worth a million. Did we? Did we? I can go asset after asset, and we ask the same questions. You look at XRP. I know there's a huge group of people, especially on the internet, that think that XRP should be trading at a a much, much higher price. Many of you were the people that bought in up here when it was $1.70 or $1.80, 2021. I happened to sell. I had a bunch of XRP that I bought really, really cheap, and I happened to sell up there, and I sold because I saw patterns that suggest it was going to go cheaper. And then I bought some more along the way in here, and I've sold some along the way. And we haven't had really big moves on XRP. I approach it totally different. Most people are saying, I'm going to buy as much XRP because it's going to go to the moon. But then here we're sitting here. It's been four, five, six years, and we're not there. I first learned about XRP in 2012. Maybe it's 2013. A guy who was working for me, he he told me, yeah, you should get into XRP. He bought in for four cents. Got a whole bunch of XRP. Been sitting on it all these years, waiting for it to go to the moon. The guy's going to die before it goes to the moon unless people come behind it and drive the price higher. It doesn't matter what you think it should be worth. It doesn't matter in theory what it should be worth. What matters is what it's trading for today. In the same time frame that some of you have been holding XRP, hoping to make a profit, you could have come over here to Solana Hold on, I got to find it. Dramatic effect lost when I can't pull it up. Some of you, for the same time that you've been been holding XRP, you could have uh, jumped into Solana back in November of last year and traded it from $20 a token to $110. And you could have 5 x your money. But we're hodling, we're hodling. Was there any way to know that Solana was the one that was going to move? The answer is, yeah, there was a way. Was there any way to know that Solana was a better trade than Bitcoin? Well, actually, probably it just made sense that Bitcoin being at thirty or $40,000 is a lot harder to double than it is to take a, a, a trade that's at $20 and 5x it to 100 Okay, And in, in the same logic says that XRP or you know, XLM or any of these that are really cheap, you know, it takes a lot, uh, it's a lot easier to double those cheaper prices. It is. But if there's no movement there, then they're not moving. There's no movement in those. They're unbelievable attention on XRP, unbelievable attention on XLM. They're not moving. So what a trader is going to do is a trader is going to move the money where there's actual movement. 
At some point, XRP is going to move. And when it moves, we can jump in and we can trade it and we can make some great profit on it. And then when we get to the top, we can close that profit. And if it goes to a dollar or if it goes to $20 or if it goes to $50 or a hundred or 5,000, we can ride that trend. But when it gets there, we still need to close it because there's no money made in hodling. You, you just want to hodl and hold on for dear life and hope for the best. What are you going to do with it? How are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to eat? We're just, we're just going to buy a company and hold it forever and will it to our kids. That doesn't do you any good. Doesn't do anybody any good. You only actually have cash, real money you can work with after you sell it and you make a profit. Well, then I got to pay taxes. Come on, folks. Come on, of course you got to pay taxes. It's called a, a capital gains tax. You make you pay the tax on the gain. So would you rather wait until it goes back down and then you, you have some loss? Come on, are we really that irrational here? We, we want to buy when it's low, when it's moving, and we want to sell when it stagnates and it stops moving or when it reverses. And you're not going to identify those turning points by looking at fundamental data. You're going to identify those turning points by looking at what's happening in the market right now. The term we use for that is technical analysis. Let's come over to silver and gold. Let me, I said I would look at these. Got to find them here. That's the ETF for gold. I'm going to, I'll actually come to the spot price for you. Okay. So this is, uh, this is basically spot gold. And this is what it's been doing forever. By forever, I mean since 2020. We peaked out just over $2,000, about $2,100 an ounce, just under $2,100 uh, in 2020. And it's been doing that ever since. So now what naturally happens, somebody's going to be typing in the comments right now, it's suppressed. It's JP Morgan. JP Morgan, they're suppressing it. They're just crushing us. If JP Morgan were to just go to jail, this stock, this price of gold would go to $50,000 an ounce. Okay, well, JP Morgan's not going to jail and the price of gold's not $50,000 an ounce. What people are willing to pay for it right now, apparently, according to this, is $2,018 an ounce. That is the current price of gold. And until it breaks through that line that I drew here, which is called a resistance line, until it breaks through that line and establishes a new trend making higher highs, that's the price of gold. Oh, but, but if this and that happens, what if we go to gold-backed currency? Then it's going to skyrocket. No, it's not. No, it's not. Let's stop being irrational. I mean, I know the market's irrational, but let's stop being foolish because this is foolish talk now. Okay, let's talk about what a pegged gold value looks like. Okay, I'll come back to this. Let's go back in time. You want to know what a gold currency looks like? This is it right here. You peg, if you peg, come on chart, work with me here. If you peg the dollar or any currency to the price of gold, this is what happens to the price of gold. You ready? Come on. It had to pull 100 years worth of data. That's why it's taking a minute. Let me get rid of all these moving average. Oh, there it is. Now you can see it. Oh, wait, you don't see any movement? Because there's not any movement. Look. Look. 1800, 1886, the price of gold, $20 an ounce. 1887, $20 an ounce. 1900, 1920, 1926, 1929. And then something happened here. What happened right there? $20 an ounce for all those years. Suddenly it's 35. And then what happens? 1935, it's $35 an ounce. 1945, it's $35 an ounce. 1955, 1965, 1971. What happened here? And the, the answer is Richard Nixon is what happened. This 
is when the gold standard was abolished. You want to know what's going to happen if we go back to a gold standard? That's going to happen. Whatever the price is, and I'm not saying it's $35 an ounce. It might be $2,000 an ounce. It might be $5,000. It might be $21.92.46 an ounce. I don't know. Nobody, please, nobody put in the comments, he's just a gold pessimist. He doesn't understand. I do understand this. Understand it unbelievably well. There will be a value date. If we go to a gold standard, there will be a date and a value that is established. And they will say, this is the price of the U.S. dollar converting to one ounce of gold. And whatever that price is, if it's $1 an ounce or if it's $1 million an ounce, it doesn't matter. That price will be the price for the next 50 years until they revalue it again. This is not an arguable fact. This is, this is just what it is because the very nature of a gold backed currency says gold no longer moves. And when you look at the price of gold and people say, are, are precious metals going up? Well, no, kind of, but the answer is no. What's going in a direction is the dollar. See, gold, one ounce of gold back here was worth $35. Now, okay, you look at this chart and you're like, well, gold got really, really valuable. Well, actually, one ounce of gold is still worth one ounce of gold. What changed was not the ounce of gold. What changed was the value of the dollar. It took more dollars. So people who are saying, oh, I just want to buy gold because I think it's a great investment and I'm going to make so many dollars. Well, what gold is, is gold is just a reflection of the weakness of your dollar. I got to get back over here to modern times. There's got to be a faster way to do this. This is taking way too much time. It's really hurting the flow of my video. There we go. There's modern times. When you see gold at $2,000 an ounce, it's not because gold went up. It's because the dollar went down. I don't care what people tell you the value of gold should be. It's going to be whatever people value it at, whatever people are willing to pay for it. And there's going to be times when people are willing to pay more. There's going to be times when people are willing to pay less. There's going to be inflationary pressures that push it one way or the other. Someone can come out and say, well, the U.S. dollar has inflated this much. This is what the value of gold should be. But the problem is, what's the standard? There is no standard for the U.S. dollar. It's completely fiat. And now we move into a very, very complex algorithm. It's not even an algorithm. It's just a very, very complex sequence of moving parts in the economy Nobody really knows what the dollar should be worth. That's the truth. And people can tell you they know, but they don't. It's, it's theory. It's theory, folks. That's fact. What you're looking at on the screen is fact. That's what gold's worth right now. Is it going to be worth more? Maybe. Quite possibly. I think there's a good chance. But I'll tell you, I will t I've been saying this for three or four years. I don't know how long I've been saying this. As long as people have been bugging me about gold. It will not be worth more until it can break out of that resistance with a vengeance. Okay? So that $2,000, $2,100 resistance that's happening on gold, it's been happening since 2020. And until it can break out of that, close above it, and stay above it, it will probably come back down and test that old resistance as a new support. Until it can do that, do not expect to see gold skyrocket. Now, I know somebody's going to give me hate messages in the comments. That's fine. I love you too. You don't have to like it. Don't shoot the messenger. Okay. Now, what about silver? Silver stuck as well. Um, this, this is what we call a channel, by the way. It's a consolidation of, of pricing. Uh, it's been stuck for a long time. Stuck right now, just above $20 an ounce. And honestly, it's probably going to stay stuck for a while. Um, I don't really want to do a video right now on price suppression because I actually, again, have, I have a different perspective. 
a lot of the, the statistics that they quote for price suppression, they're actually just quoting factors that don't actually suppress price. So, you know, is the price of silver suppressed? I, I can't prove that. Um, what I can tell you is this is the price of silver right now. This is what it's trading for. What I can tell you is this is what people are willing to pay for it. And until it actually gets momentum, it's going to stay around this value. And it's going to go up and it's going to go down and it's going to fluctuate, but it's going to stay here. Are we looking at $5,000 an ounce silver? If people are willing to pay it, sure. Sure. Are we going to sit here and value it and say this is what it should be worth? No, I'm not going to do that. And the reason I'm not going to do it is because as you've seen over the last hour, hour and a half, however long I've been going, as you have seen over this time that we've been, been doing this, um, the fundamentals don't matter. Core market value does not matter. You get to choose. Do you want to be right? You want to stick with your dogma? Do you want to try to keep finding more videos to prove that you were right and you should have done X, Y, Z? Or do you want to be rich? <laughs> and listen, I, I want to be really clear as I wrap this up. I am not telling any of you that you've made a bad decision if you've bought XRP or if you've bought Bitcoin or if you've bought gold or if you bought silver. I happen to own all of that. Okay, I'm not telling anybody that you made a bad decision. What I am saying is your expectation for that investment may not be in alignment with reality. And that, that doesn't mean you made a mistake. It means that you need to slow down step back, maybe readjust expectations, step back and say, okay, should I have this much in XRP? Might I want to move a little bit over to something else? Might I want to move some of my gold over here? What I want to, you get to decide. I mean, the beautiful thing about being an educated investor is you empower yourself. I've been, I've been doing trading and financial education now for a long time <laughs> since 2008 and and the whole philosophy that I've had over all these years is give people the tools so that you can do it give you the education so that you can make your decisions you can't abdicate those decisions to other people I mean you can but it's just you're going to get bad results when you abdicate to other people don't trust me don't trust somebody else who just came out and says, oh, this is what the price should be. Go follow it up. I mean, I gave you the data. I gave you the information right here. It's public. You can go look at it. You realize if you if you run the numbers that what I everything I shared with you in this video, it has to be true. The fundamentals just obviously are not driving the price. You, you can disagree with that. In philosophy, you can say, well, they should drive the price. If, if it wasn't so much market manipulation, it would. No, it's not actually market manipulation. It's the public. The public is the ones, are the ones who are establishing the value because it's what they're willing to pay. So let's get out of this, you know, constant, it's man, being manipulated. Is there manipulation? Yes, there's manipulation. Is it so much manipulation that everything is manipulated and nothing is, is free market? No, it's just not. I'm sorry. You can believe it is, but it's not. Boom. There's a whole bunch more comments telling me that I'm crazy. Don't listen to this guy. He's, he's falling off the loony train. No. Folks, educate yourself. Learn how to look at investments. Um, diversify. Okay? It's like, like um, King Solomon said. <laughs> Invest in seven things. No, eight things. You don't know which one's going to work. Yeah, so if, if you have this idea that if I put all my money in XRP, I'm going to be rich, that's just a fundamentally flawed ideology. It's just a bad idea. If you say, I'm going to put all my money in Bitcoin, I'll be rich. I'm going to put all my money in silver, I'll be rich. I'm going to put all my money in gold, I'll be rich. No, 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 no. It is a fundamentally flawed idea of how you do it. Is that, am I saying that Bitcoin's bad? No. Am I saying XRP's bad? No. Am I saying gold's bad, silver's bad? No, I'm not saying any of that. I'm saying that you got to diversify and you got to understand with your investment objectives you know, what are you trying to do? What are you trying to invest more? Are you trying to just park your money in a random cryptocurrency that you're hoping is going to, you know, 100,000 X in the next 25, 30 years? Okay, then maybe XRP is perfect for you. Are you trying to retire? 
<laughs> are you trying to like replace your current income so you can stop working and you can bring in money and you can have the income that you need so that you can pay your bills and you can feed yourself? Because if that's your plan, if that's what you're trying to do, if that's why you're looking at silver, if that's why you're looking at, at cryptocurrency, if that's why you're looking at gold or whatever it is you're looking at, if your plan is I, I got to like retire and I need some money, need some cash flow, well, don't be looking at a 30-year horizon. You got to be looking at a short term, something that's going to create cash flow for you. You see, so every objective, every investment objective has a different way that you want to get into whatever the investments are that you're working with. If you're looking for cash flow, you're looking for, you know, something you can put money in that's going to provide passive income for you. You can do that with crypto. You can do that right now with cryptocurrency. You can put your cryptocurrency up for staking and actually bring in passive income with it. You could do that with real estate. You could buy yourself some rental properties and you can bring in money from your rentals. You can actually do that with stock. I can show you, if you don't know how, I can show you how you can buy stock and you can bring money in every month by, um, by doing different techniques, different strategies that you actually get paid every month above and beyond anything like a dividend, like 10 times better than a dividend. If you just want to park it for the next 30 years, then maybe, maybe those are perfect places to do it. I don't know. I have no idea what's going to happen in 30 years and you don't either. Shoot, I'm good to know what's going to happen in 30 months. <laughs> I'm doing really good to know what's going to happen in 30 days, right? And you are too. So who are we kidding here when we sit here and we say, what's the future of X asset? What price do you think it's going to be? I'm going to tell you 10 years from now exactly what I tell you today. It's worth whatever someone's willing to pay for it. Not a dollar more. It's worth then what it is now, what someone's willing to pay for it. If you want to go a little bit deeper in this, as I was putting these slides together, I was trying to think, what should I tell them to do next? And then I remembered about a month ago, I kind of forgot I did this, but I did a webinar about a month ago called The Market Matrix. Looks like that right there. Market Matrix, you can find it for free over at trademaestro.com if you want to learn more. In this, uh, it's about another hour and a half webinar or so that I did. Um, I, I take these same principles of fundamental and technical analysis, but I actually show you how to draw that support and resistance and how the matrix is built, the actual matrix of where the prices are moving. So if you find a lot of the information I just shared interesting, um, this market matrix video is not about... Um, valuation. It's about how to know the direction of the price and where you should target getting in, where you should target getting out, how trends evolve, all of that. It's kind of like the next evolution beyond, okay, now that we've figured out fundamental analysis doesn't work, what do we do now? It's that. Okay. So if you want to learn some more, you can go over there and check that out. If you are not subscribed to wherever you're watching this, if you're watching on YouTube or, or uh, Facebook or Telegram, wherever it is, if you're not subscribed, you should do that right now. You should definitely subscribe because you never know when I might drop a groundbreaking video like this where everything in your world, everything in your paradigm completely changes. And of course, go over and visit us at trademaestro.com. Trademaestro.com, sign up for something free over there so we can get your email address and we can keep you updated with all the stuff that's going on. Thank you for watching. I hope this has been helpful for you. Leave some comments, but you know, make them nice. I'm just sharing with you, just sharing you my ideas. But let me know what you think. And if you got some more questions, be sure to reach out. And I'll do my best to help you moving forward. Until next time, folks, happy trading. We'll talk to you soon.